Doris Deer. It's Doris with a cocktail in She's the perfect housewife. I don't want this from my mother. The daughter? Now, yeah, maybe. It's Doris and her dear friends. They live up in the sky. But for the chance to sing and dance, her friends might also buy. It's Doris. It's Doris. Hi, dears! Welcome back to Doris Deer's Girl Talk. I'm your hostess, Doris Deer, otherwise known as America's Perfect Housewife. Good to see you back in the rumpus room. Now, we're continuing our deep dive into Miss Arlene Dahl's book, Always Ask a Man, Arlene Dahl's Key to Femininity. But before we do, here's a little bit of gossip about Miss Dahl. Now, in 1956, Miss Dahl made some films in England for Columbia Pictures, one being Wicked As They Come. In March 1957, Arlene Dahl filed suit against Columbia for one million dollars, claiming the advertising for the film was obscene, degrading, and offensive. She said that she was humiliated by the use of composite drawings and photographs advertising the film. Now, the case went to trial in May, and the judge was highly unsympathetic during the hearing, saying he felt the photograph was refined and that Miss Dahl looked better on film. <laughs> Oops. Well, the case was dismissed that August. Now sit back and let's go to 1965. <laughs> now, chapter 16 is one of my favorites. It's called Instant Sex. This is the era of instant coffee, instant soup, and instant sex. Nobody seems to have time anymore to start from scratch. This seems to be the pattern of today's romance, packaged, pre-cooked, frozen, ready to thaw and serve at a moment's notice. I gotta start going to a better supermarket. Mm. What's the hurry? What are we saving time for, if not for the leisurely enjoyment of all the thrilling stages of love? The kind that starts with the basic ingredients and is slowly and lovingly simmered, stirred, and tasted <laughs> at frequent intervals to savor each additional seasoning, never allowed to come to boil until all the ingredients have been blended to perfection. <laughs> Whew. We still talking about food or love or I don't know. Continuing. The art of flirtation seems to have perished at the jet age. Before the advent of instant sex, beautiful women courted attention by employing certain feminine accessories. Hmm. To entrance, entice, intrigue. Hmm. The destinies of nations and their leaders have been altered by the drop of a handkerchief, the flutter of a fan. So why not revive these delightful customs of the past to stimulate romance? Delightful indeed. <laughs> Perhaps the most subtle means of flirtation disappeared from our culture with the advent of air conditioning. I'm speaking of the fan. Its language is universally understood. Now, I never remember Taffy or any of our friends using a fan at parties or any other time. I can only imagine all their friends fanning away in the rumpus room or at a cocktail lounge. Fanning, fanning away. That would create quite a breeze. <laughs> Romance is an art, and it is the woman's role to create it. Now, there's an entire page of illustrations on how to use your fan. Here, let's try a few. I want to talk to you. Fan over mouth, open and fanning back and forth. Please keep our secret. Fan closed over mouth. I listen. Fan closed behind right ear. The most important. Let's go. Fan closed, held diagonally across the chest with both hands. Wow, that is so much work. 
I think I'll just stick with my fabulous voice. Now, next week, we'll finish up reading from Miss Doll's book with some wonderful advice from some of her male movie star friends. You are going to love these. So mix up a great cocktail, sit back, get comfy, and be transported back to 1965 with Doris Deer and Arlene Dahl. <laughs> and don't forget, you can find all these stories on my website at www.dorisdeer.com forward slash girl, G-U-R-L hyphen talk. All one word. <laughs> oh, who could that be? Hello! I am so thrilled that I am still here. Masks off! We're COVID safe at the Girl Talk Rumpus Room. I am happy to hear that. Welcome to the Rumpus Room, Jenna Robbins. Broadway actress, television actress, producer... Like it goes on and on. We're going to be here all day. That's all I got to say. Okay. Well, but I'm, to start I'm off, to start off, we are celebrating through alcohol. That's we are wonderful. celebrating old Hollywood. And today I bring you the Doris Deer Rosalind Russell because I feel like it fits you. Oh, yeah. I can't I even believe Come you on. said that oh, yeah, to it's me. The Rosalind Russell. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. mm. now that's daytime drinking. Oh, that's um, that's, that's quite good. That's yeah. um, that's a <laughs> little loose in the lips. That really, like I, <laughs> I think that that is. Um, can I say what I think that is? Sure. Uh, Southern Comfort is what I think that is. It's Aquavit based. Aquavit, which is I lived in Denmark for three years producing and writing. Blah blah blah. Yeah. Whatever. She's had a career, and <laughs> Aquavit is. Made from caraway seed. Wow. So it's very caraway mixed with some white sherry, which is near impossible to find. I'm telling but you. But it is the Roz delicious. Russell. It's it's based on an actual drink that they made for Roz Russell at the Stork Club in New York City. So it's it's yeah. Well I, mean, I have to tell you, when I was a young girl and we're not here to talk about Roz Russell, but I can tell you that I relate to that. And for you to just invite me to come in and talk to you and then make a Roz Russell. Come you on. Know, I mean, all right, let's just hop right in there and okay. we'll we'll backtrack later. Well, but Gypsy. All right. Yes. Gypsy. But... And I saw you. It's the role every girl like me wants to play. I Mazeppa. Because, honey, she's a baritone. We love that. <laughs> <laughs> she's got that deep voice. I mean, Mazeppa. I saw you do Mazeppa and it was a uh, me. That whole show, I have to say, I remember. Uh, it was Tyne Daly, right? It was Tyne Daly. Daly. And I remember when they announced her, everyone was like, Tyne Daly, Gypsy? It was one of my favorites. One wow. of my favorite revivals. And I don't know, maybe we could dish on what she was like. But we can. We can. Good. We can, because L- I have lots go. to say. Well, but let me, let, me, let me backtrack for just a second there. First of all, um, when my agent was Tyne Daly's agent. And so when he first called me and he said that Tyne Daly is going to be doing Mama Rose, I had at that point in my career decided that I would never stand by again. Now there's the terms under study, stand by, but at that point right. I was, it was important to me that I was the standby. And, um, you know, I said I wasn't going to do it anymore. And when he called me about it, I said, wait a minute, are you talking about, do I want to stand by for the quintessential role for a female in the American musical theater as Mama Rose? Uh, I think so. And now here's your dish. Your dish isn't going to be as, as dishy as you'd like it to be because I have nothing but good to say about Tyne Daly. Oh, good. She, no, I she love was that, an amazing. Though. You know, I always talked about her being like the head of the captain of the ship. Uh, when I first went on as Mama Rose, and I did ten days after I joined the show, uh, time yeah, time was leaving to go to her daughter's graduation, I think, and they hadn't told me. She met me and she said, well, I'm glad you're here because you know you're doing the Saturday matinee in, uh, in Hartford. I said, what? <laughs> oh and, and then she sent me two dozen roses the day I did that, 10 wow. days into rehearsal. She was magnificent. It is still as much as I love doing Mazeppa, and I did Mazeppa, they twisted my arm because you see when I was that age, which is what year did we do that? 19, 1989 to 1992 is right. what I think. 
at that point, it's a long time ago, right? But oh, at yeah. that point, I thought I was way too old to shake my booty and not wear any clothes and play Mazeppa. And they just really wanted me to do that. I finally gave in. Says the girl in snake skin <laughs> uh, jagging. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Honey, you could shake it like Mazeppa right now. Well, it would be good. I'll, thank uh, you. you. could toot you very that much. Horn. Back then, I thought I was old. Now, I don't think I am anymore. No. No. Well, that's great because, you know, it... Uh, we had Anita Gillette on, and she said yes. she had the, the same great things to say. About Tyne, or? No, oh. about, about uh, her time in, Gyp in, um, oh. um, in Gypsy. She was in the original. That's right. Yeah, That's and right. she said, you know, like, everyone was so great. There's no dishing. It was, like, so great, all those No, our cast was exist. magnificent. Yeah. Our cast was magnificent. It's still the terrific. highlight. Of Thank you. Girl. Still the highlight of my career, I think. Well, well the highlight of my mind. career is you sitting on my couch. Oh, <laughs> All right. Your mom. We got to talk about your mom for Well, I appreciate that. She's, I, I mean, I lost my mom to Alzheimer's very kind of, you oh. know, like, which has brought Doris Deer to fruition because of Doris to celebrate my mother, who was amazing. I come from an amazing family. But your mom is still alive and kicking. She's... What did you say? Well, I said to you, I haven't had it exactly, but I think we're about six weeks shy of uh, 99. Oh, and uh, is... my mother, as long as you brought her up, okay? Yeah. My mother used to take dance lessons with Jean, Jean Kelly. Jean Kelly, I wanted to ask you about this. In Pennsylvania? In Pennsylvania. Yes. I grew up in a small... I don't, how, do you, how do you remember that? Okay. Wikipedia is a girl's I'll friend. I'll tell you, I like that. <laughs> so I grew up in Pennsylvania, and I came out wanting to sing and dance, and Mom sent me to dancing school at four. You know, um, I don't think there are many people that are as lucky as I am, because I actually really have a very loving mother who believed in everything I wanted to do, who supported my doing that. You go the whole way back to Gypsy at the St. James Theater. There was a week that I went on for time, that she took a week's vacation. They brought in Joanne Worley to stand by for me. I was thrilled, right? Wait, and Joanne I... Worley played Mazeppa? No, oh. she just covered me while I, oh, while I was, I was like, mama. Oh, no, she was she was Mazeppa. The Mazeppa understudy was on, but Joanne was 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 there to cover right. me in case anything happened. And at the St. James, the star dressing room that Tyne had had one of these. What are they? Uh, almost like in a barn where the what the shutters open up. Right. And the dressing room had a balcony that looked down on the stage. My oh, parents, come on. It's true. And my parents were there and all kinds of friends to see me during that week's run. But I will never forget the night that she stayed in the dressing room and I was on stage singing uh, Everything's Coming Up Roses and I could look to my left and see my mother up there on the balcony oh. leaning over watching me play Rose. And I'm telling you... Nothing like it. <laughs> what a moment in life. That is, I mean, mm, okay. Okay. Yeah, that's where I mean, we go with you me. know, my mother was, my mom and dad and my sister were everything. And I've lost them all. Oh. And they were everything. I was so lucky to have the ability to be whoever I wanted to be in life. And them just to say, okay, pass the potatoes. I mean, that's kind of what happened. I told them, that, you know, when I came out to them, they, my dad was like, oh, so. all right. So can I have the gravy before it gets cold? Like it was just, and this was, you know, 1974. I mean, having that in our lives no. is everything. It, because it is everything. It's who I am in my soul, it's who I am in my heart is because of that. And I, and I think that I can I can say the same thing to you, you know, I mean, for, for a woman that has spent all of her life in show business and uh, acting as well as directing and producing and everything, I really still am the woman that everybody says, so hi, Jenna, how's your mother? Uh, and I feel good about that. I feel you, wonderful about you that. You should. It's an, oh. Okay. Okay. All right. Whew. Okay. <laughs> All right, so your, your mother studied with Gene Kelly. All right, but now, I, I'm like all over the place because I have That's so okay. much information Let, of you. Let's go. Your Broadway debut was in Good News. You were the standby for Alice Faye. 
Yes, I was. The 1974. Episode, in 19... <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> the year you're mentioning. Yeah, my after- I came out, and you were on and Broadway. I was on Broadway. See, we're connected. We are. We're like one soul. We are. Yeah, no, my, my first... I, I, I took a baby on that on the road with me, because I'm also on top of everything we're talking about, a mother. Uh, and uh, he schlepped him. I used to say, you know, once I was Mazeppa... No, once it was a schlepper, now I'm just Mazeppa, right? Now I miss Mazeppa. Now I say, once it was Mazeppa, now I'm just a schlepper. But that's not <laughs> true, because now I'm a producer. I but, like it. Okay. We may have to title that. I'm there you saying. go. <laughs> but uh, uh, that was that was a great show, too. It was one of the first Broadway shows I ever auditioned for. They were looking for a, oh, my God, you know, uh, the Archie comic strips. Yeah. They were looking for a blonde character, and I can't think of her name right now, that they wanted. Betty. Maybe, because I said, but what Betty. about Veronica? Why not Veronica? Yeah, Veronica's the sex pop. Yeah, the, the brunette sex pop. Rich. So I came in. That's me. Yeah. So the sorority queen, the bitch. Yeah. You know, and I got that part, and it was the first major Broadway show. We were on tour, like with Gypsy, for nine months pre, you know, pre-Broadway before coming in with Stubby K. We, uh, that I could dish you about forever. That's a show. That's a story. You could have me here for hours, because <laughs> uh, the sets burned in the... In the <laughs> The uh, uh, airport on the way in, and uh, all kinds of shenanigans went on before good news. We like shenanigans. We, they were, we they enjoy were, shenanigans. I know those shenanigans. I have to write a book. You got to write a book. Everybody's writing books anymore. Come on, write I haven't a book. done it yet, but I have to. Well, I this will. is part. You know, we're creating. Uh, one of the reasons I love doing the girl talk. Cheers. Cheers. Is because this is great history that we don't ever want to lose, and. 20, like I, I said, when we were talking about doing this show and making like this drink, a Ross Russell, like how many people under a certain age would even know who that is? But the important is that we continue to let people know who this That's is. That's correct. Who our that. history is. The Broadway history, the people who made Broadway, it's forever changing. It's always changing. It always has. But it's an important history to be reminded of. And, you know, to... To let people who are growing up in Oklahoma know, we're not really from New York, you know. We're from everywhere. And I, it sounds so corny, but dreams do come true. Dreams do come true. My That's... life, I am so lucky to have my life. And every aspect of it, to spend 40, I'm 42 years as a full-time in this industry. I, I've never been a huge star, but it doesn't matter. It's so full and your life is full well but I can say the same thing to you I mean I wanted you know when I was younger I came to New York because I wanted to be Barbara Streisand I wanted you know her career or, or Bette Miller, Midler's you know career and there was this thing about wanting the acknowledgement of, of being the best in the business and becoming a star and what's very interesting when you talk about dreams is that the truth is dreams absolutely come true and even the dreams you didn't know about I have had dreams come true and I just go thank you God when did I ask for that? But what's and the important thing? Place. The important thing is that we keep ourselves open to, to make rec- those dreams and That's recognize correct. them. And because some in. people say, no, I'm not, no, 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 no. And I've always been, hell yeah, let's okay, go. Let's go. Let's Why not? That. Worst case, I'll go to Denmark, I'll hate it, I'll fly home. Three years later, I produced 20 shows and brought the first Broadway show to Denmark. That's how like you that, and come I on. met at first. first yeah, first I mean, age. like, it's like, that's what life is about, is, especially yes. as an artist. Especially yes, as an I artist. agree. I agree. 1988, Romance, Romance. Romance, Romance. 1983, happen. Crimes of the Heart. 1977, I Love My Wife. Oh, I loved that show. Oh, my God. And, okay, 2000, uh, 2000 one of my absolute favorite shows well, I hope you're, written you're just by about good thank you. friend tale my... of the allergies wife oh so i have to tell you charles Sam, bush charles bush is oh. amazing oh my he gosh he is another i amazing... can't have him on my show because i think i'll just pale in comparison <laughs> he's so amazing he's oh, so and, great oh and so real and oh, so yeah, honest yeah. you know he, I mean, when i got the call about that it was a, a situation like we're talking about again because it was did i want to again cover michelle lee and Linda Lavin. And I had kept saying, well, I'm only going to play the roles I'm not going to cover. Agent calls about this, and they said, well, go and see the show. So I go and see the show at this tiny little theater over, you know, at City Center. Right. And, and I sit there, and it's like, 
line laugh, line laugh, line, line laugh. And I'm sitting, I'm hysterical. I'm thinking I could stand by for both of these roles yeah. at the same time. Both are you again. bet I want yeah. to do it, right? And then I came in and I auditioned for Lynn Meadow and Charles was there and he walked up to me. I've never really had anybody, when you're walking into an audition, and said, Thank you so much yeah. for being here. No, we don't hear that very often very, as actors. Right. And during rehearsals, you know, or even when the audience was there and I was watching, he'd come over and take my hand and go, so what do you think? You think they like it? I mean, my, my aunt, you know, was here. He just, it was a magnificent, and that was one of those gifts because it was the first time ever in my life that I ever took a vacation. I used to tell the story. When I went into the business, there wasn't such a thing as a vacation. No. You didn't get sick days. You didn't get personal days. No. You didn't get a vacation. I and was, you couldn't say, out of the eight shows, I'm only doing six. No, no. <laughs> you couldn't say, no, I, no. you were always there. And I had never taken a vacation because I was either in a show and I couldn't, or the show had closed and I was afraid to because I would miss an audition, right? Right. So I went to Israel, took my son to Israel because this show closed at City Center and I was the one cast member, other than the stars, that stayed with it and made the move to Broadway and we had three months and I knew I was going to Broadway to travel and have a vacation. Wow. Great experience. It's such a great show and look, I'm a new, I grew up on Staten Island, everybody knows this. Really? Thing. I didn't know that. Oh, you didn't know that. <laughs> and you know, I mean, to see a show like that, it's so New York. It's such a New York experience. And if you grew up here, it's just such a gift and such a great show. I absolutely. It's I, so funny. And my favorite part really was was covering Linda's role because to play Michelle's role, I put on the clothes and walked on stage. But to play Linda's role, oh. and it was funny because I had people that would come. I'd call and I'd say, "I'm on." Maverick, do you remember casting director Barry Moss? Oh, yeah. I loved Barry yeah. Moss, and he used to call me all the time. So I called him and said I was on. He said, I'm coming to see it. So he's watching the opening scene, and he goes to the lead usher, the head usher, and he said, Jana Robbins told me she was on, but that's Linda. They go, no, 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 that's Jana. He said, no, I know Jana. All the oh time. I love playing roles where nobody actually even gets that it's me. It's then an actor's I'm really dream, doing my right? job. That's it's great. an actor's dream. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Tony nomination for Ragtime as a producer. Yes. So let's talk about producing. So okay. we have, you're way more ventured into the commercial producing than I am. Okay. I've been a, I was a producer on television for years. I was nominated for a few awards. Oh, I'm going to have to look your Wikipedia She's on nominated. Um, but decided to do commercial producing because I'm producing my own work. It's what yes. we do as artists anymore, yes. right? Like you better you know. Do it a lot. So I, you know, Jack Vertel is one of my best friends now. Okay. He's been an amazing mentor, just great, and Tom Vertel. Um, but what? It's interesting because the first time I sat on the other side of that table, and people came in and went, "What are your?" We and I thought, <laughs> are they thinking about maybe I didn't treat him her so well? I like <laughs> you know, it's an interesting experience. So explain, talk to me about your decision to go into producing and why, and how okay. that feels. Okay, there really wasn't a, a, a decision, and, and I've said to lots of people because you know I, I try to mentor and give back to people the way they have given to me. Yeah, and you know, so when I do that or I teach or I talk. It, it wasn't about a decision. It was about looking at the doors that opened and all the ways that I wanted to be involved in the theater because as long as it was the theater, I was finding you know great satisfaction really in doing that. But I can tell you the way it really started. I was doing Gypsy, and it was 1989. And in the 80s, I was losing all of my friends to the AIDS epidemic. And I have always uh, wanted to do this sort of thing, uh, make a difference with whether it, my performance inspires somebody, makes a difference, or, or my producing. Um, I started raising money for Broadway Cares, Equity Fights, AIDS by producing AIDS benefits. Wow. 
And that is when I realized that I also had a capacity to be able to pull things together and use a part of me. And this is going to be dishing about myself. I think when I was younger, as an actress, people used to take this this commitment and this drive, and they'd say, well, don't get in Janet Robbins' way because you know she'll just bulldoze through to get what she wants. Well, Janet Robbins, as the producer, bulldozing through to get what she wants and making sure that the show happens or pulling the team together is exactly Exactly, you know, what needs to be done. That's what producers are. Right. Right? We have to bulldoze our way through. You got to. Because otherwise nothing gets done. Got to save the done. show or nothing yeah. happens. Yeah. So it really, really started that way. And then little by little, I realized that I was producing. And I started doing some small off-Broadway producing. And little by little, it just led me to yeah. the right projects. And then I made my Broadway debut with one of my favorite people in the world who's not here anymore. And that is Randall Reggett who was my friend and mentor, and I did Little Women with him. And wow. that Little Women catapulted me into the experience of actually being a Broadway producer and continuing to move forward. It happened to me. That's, I wanted it. And again, it's we talked earlier about that sort of dream in our careers, and you have to be open to it. Like, you have to allow that in to move forward. Or you shut the door and say, no. I'm I'm an actor. I'm a this. this well, is that's what I, what I was about to say to you because it's also part of that. Yeah. I mean, if I had stuck to that, I had to be this star in order to be okay or to be fulfilled. I was looking at that and I was realizing that wow, I could either look at my life as well, I hadn't attained what I wanted, or I could look at my life and see, but wait, what was I attending and what doors were opening for me? I mean, I know you're going to go. I hope to Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish, which was like, what? Me? So you want me to do the, be the lead producer yeah. on this show? So wait, let's talk about this because I so I saw the show and look, Fiddler on the Roof is one of the great all time musical theater shows. It's who doesn't know Fiddler on the Roof? If you like theater, musical theater, you know Fiddler on the Roof. And uh, so I went to see it and I thought Downtown or Uptown? Downtown. Okay. And Uptown. Oh, thank you. And I thought, okay, I'm as white bread, Staten Island Catholic <laughs> as they come. But I'm going to Yiddish theater tonight, baby. Let's go. So I went and I, like, up, you know, when you had the side panels with the yeah. English, I just made the decision, you know what? I'm not going to look at those. I don't need to look at those. I may not have, I actually, now that I... This is so weird. I just remembered. I was in Fiddler at an equity dinner theater in Maryland. What did I play? I was the most waspy little <laughs> Jewish guy. I had one of the roles. I don't even remember. Fiedke? Yes. Oh, my God. I was the whitest, most... <laughs> oh, my God. That's so funny. Anyway, I just decided, you know, I'm not going to look at that because yeah. I want to experience... I had a friend in the show. I wanted to experience that and... I didn't understand, but I totally understood. I didn't need to see that. It was, I have to say, congratulations. I'm not blowing this up here, know what? It was fantastic. It was better uh, for me, my opinion, my opinion. It was better than the revival. It was yes. so amazing. Well, I think it so was too. the heart. It, it was it the was, heart. You know what, honey? It was the heart, but it was also the soul. Yes. What came through, because the people were speaking the language that the yes. people really would be speaking, that you actually felt you, like like you weren't watching a musical, but you were watching a music. It was like you were there and everything that it said. Yeah. Uh, and, and all the stuff that has been always in that show, but didn't think about it. Women finally being able to step out and step up for themselves and say, no, I'm going to marry for love. I'm not going to follow this tradition. And the love in that family, and then being up against the year that we did this with with what was going on with immigration and the caravans trying to get in the United States and what was going on, all at the same time that this landed in my lap and was even an opportunity for me to say, oh, yes, yes, I'm going to... People said to me, but Jana, do you think this is commercial? I said, here's what I know. Yeah. I have to do this. And right. I did. And that's, you know, as a producer, that's why you produce. For me... I get offers, we know. We get the emails. Right. All the time. The only reason I want to produce is because I want 
that voice heard. That's correct. Otherwise, I'm not interested. I don't need a $32 million musical full of rhinestone. I, it's just not my thing. Not to say that that's bad. Everybody has their thing. But for me, I only want to do what gives the message that I think is important Correct. to the world, to the theater world, to the regular world, to everybody, because I've been given so many gifts in my life. And I know that we, so Fiddler on the Roof with Hal Luftig, I mean. Can I tell a story and Hal will be okay with his right? Yes. The biggest gift was at one point when uh, Chris Massamine, who worked for the uh, Folkspin Theater, uh, called and said, uh, the Wall Street Journal has gotten word that this might have some legs. And, you know, would you be the producer who would be willing to talk to the Wall Street Journal? Well, I thought about that for about, what, a half a millisecond? Yeah. Yes! <laughs> yes, I will be the producer that will talk to the Wall Street Journal. Janet Robbins talking to the Wall Street Journal. So I did. And the next day, I get a call. How Luftig would like to talk to you, uh, you know, about <laughs> Fiddler on the Roof. And he calls, and we, we make this, uh, because certainly when you're going to produce, you want to step up and work with the best, right? Of course. And how Lefty calls me and he said, well, I just wanted to call you to tell you I saw that. I took my aunt. I didn't know what to expect. We walked into this auditorium. He said, and then I sat down and I have to tell you, I was verklempt. I, you know, I don't have time to do this show, but I'm just calling you to tell you <laughs> how much I liked it. And I hung up the phone and Hal has heard this story again and again. And I thought, I think I just met my producing partner. There you go. And it was wonderful working with him on that show. Well, that was great. And I mean, so uh, the show garnered both you and Hal Luft, the 2019 Drama Desk Award for Outstanding Revival of a Musical. That's correct. The New York Outer Critics Award for Best Revival correct. of a Musical. Yes. Drama Critics Award Special Citation. And the Off-Broadway Alliance Award, Award for Best Musical Revival. Yes. Come on. That's what it did. So... Tell me, as a producer, because I remember we we were at a Broadway Cares event and we were talking about it, and you told me the story. I, you didn't really think you were going to produce this. You no. had no intention, nothing, mm -hmm. and it sort of fell into your lap mm -hmm. as you just told us. And I, again, it's about being open to what falls in our lap. And you say, "Yeah, why not? Let's go. Let's do it." Right. And I mean, I remember again. Little white person from Staten Island, good Catholic girl. Um, you know, the dress always had to come to below the knee as you knee oh, kneeled on the floor and played, to... Dear St. Anne, get me a man. Um, <clears throat> the truth. And uh, <laughs> they didn't know what to do with me back then. Um, but, I mean, I remember the Yiddish theater and hearing about the Yiddish theater, which sort of was like over in one of the boroughs. For those not in New York, the boroughs. Right, it was around forever and it didn't have this time. home that it, it didn't ended have up a home. having. And you brought it to a completely different space, to a commercial space, a commercial open space. to everybody. One seat shy of a Broadway house. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but I mean, you know, I think that I remember, I remember hearing on the boards and everything that you were doing this. And I thought this, now this is a ride. This. Janet's doing a, she's going on a ride on this one. And I, good for you because you. for me, becoming a producer, that's what it's about. It's about creating new space for voices that need to be heard. Well, that was the other wonderful thing, uh, which is that that particular theater really hadn't had a hit, hadn't had a run. It was really big, as I said, one seat shy of being a Broadway house. Uh, we weren't going to take it to Broadway because I wasn't going to compete with Hamilton. And because, and needless to say, just like you said, when you say, do you want to go see Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish, people were going, you know, so we wanted to move it and we needed a big space because it was a big cast and we needed a space that either was an alternative space and this was right there and it never had a hit. We proved that that house can support, you know, theater and we gave equity cards to so many people who were non-equity. They just went down there to do six weeks on a show that was being directed within an inch of its life by Joel Gray, and they thought it was a little six-week summer gig. Wait. Everybody Directed by Joel, Joel Gray. Gray. Come on! 
I mean, the whole thing is, it's, it's just so great. It's so great. I, by the way... I have a little connection, maybe, Two. because I got my equity card up in the Borscht Belt, working with some of the greats up that was in, I quit college, much to my parents' chagrin, to d do theater, which I had never done in my life, oh. ever. In, and I got to college and I was a swimmer and they put me in a show because they needed a body and a, and a pair of shorts and Jesus Christ Superstar. And I thought, this is cool. I end up getting a job in summer stock and getting the lead in four shows. I was like, w How did what? this happen? And one of them, by the way, <clears throat> company. Let's uh -huh. talk. Well, talk about a... Let's get right in there. Oh, I'm a genius at this. You're very good. Yes, You're I'm very, very good. Very good. <clears throat> I'm that's what the, well, that's what my husband you. says. I'm um, glad. All right, so let's talk. First of all, company. One of my favorite. So I was a freshman at University of Maryland. Had never done theater, as I said. They hired, and I went. They said, "Oh, come see. We're doing company." I was like, "What's that?" And I went and saw the show, and I thought, "Oh, this is amazing." I still to this day. One of my favorite shows ever. I love everything about it. I love it, love it, love it. Of course, I have my own concept of what it's really about. There you go. I love it. Okay. I love it. And it convinced me to do theater, which literally the following summer, I'm at Summer Stock doing company as one of the husbands. Oh with my. no training, not one dance class, not one singing, nothing. And I'm like... What? Maximilian and Candy. Like crazy. That's so crazy. You produce a new version with a female lead of company in London. Correct. You win the Olivier Award. Yes, it was quite the year. <laughs> so tell me about this. This is, and I thought, I remember hearing about it and thinking, well, how does that work? I don't know how this works. How does this work? Tell me about All that right. experience. So, you know, and why. as with uh, uh, Fiddler on the Roof, I mean, on Company, I was not the lead producer. I am a co-producer on yeah. it, and and I joined them in London. By the way, let's explain really quickly. Co-producer, yeah. there's the lead producer who is the person who has spent years and years and years, usually a lot of money, brings the artists together, brings works the on show the shows. Together. Co-producers bring in a certain percentage of money Correct. of the overall of the budget. You have capitalization. You bring in a bunch of investors but they all report to you and you are eligible for a Tony Award. That's correct. And that's why, and it takes a lot of co-producers depending on the show. That's why they all run up at the Tonys. People are like, why are so many people? Because it takes they, that many take, people it, yes. to get it a takes commercial. takes a village. It takes a village. It takes and a village the co-producers especially are a big part of that village. So right. I just want our audience to know. But in this particular case, this is another fast yes, just like the Wall Street Journal. I went to see a Candor and Ebb show uh, with producer Catherine Schreiber, who was on this in London. And she just said to me, oh, by the way, you know, I'm working on and, you know, would you be interested in coming on board as a producer? Directed by Marianne Elliott. Well, had you seen War Horse? Had you seen... seen um, Hello. Uh, I'm, I'm, why am I going to go blank in a second? It's a name. And so I do uh, the, the... About the dog. The Curious Incident. Curious Incident. Uh, what? Yeah, you know. And, and I, Marion Elliott, you know, and Chris Harper uh, out of the National Theater was her partner. And the minute she just even said who the team was, because I was also doing some producing uh, in London and I really wanted to get to know the, the London scene as well as the New York scene, those names, and I just went... Yes. And then after that, you know, started learning about what they were doing uh, and uh, went and saw the show out there. I wasn't I wasn't day to day involved, but I certainly was involved as a producer. And I was thrilled with this show. Uh, one of the people that won a great award, Jonathan Bailey, doing me, pardon me, is anybody here because if anybody's here, I want to thank you all for coming to the wedding, is now on Bridgerton as oh. the older brother on Bridgerton. Oh, right. And he oh. was like, he was magnificent. And, and then coming to New York, and then, of course, the pandemic. But I think we are one of the shows that will absolutely so be So let's talk about that. You were, you were in previews. 
We were in previews. How far into previews and how close to opening were you? Well, you know, it, so much time has passed that I have to tell you that I can't tell you the numbers. I knew you were going to yeah. ask me this sort of thing. <laughs> but, you know, we had we had done our, our uh, opening shows. I think we've been in previews for a good two and a half weeks, maybe going on third. I think we were less than two weeks away from opening. That That's my yeah. approximation without giving you the exact Because I had tickets for one of the preview performances and then it got shut down. Yeah. I mean, just really surprising. I mean, I certainly remember where I was, what I was doing. I was in rehearsal for, for one of my nightclub shows, you know, that I well, told you about that. I mean, my duo show Haley with Haley Swindle. Swindle. Come on, you know? Miss Haley. Yeah, I mean, we were we were in the rehearsal room, and I remember they were putting out all this stuff, and I was talking about, I think maybe we got to, like, not rehearse, and oh, come on, come on. Next day, Broadway, you know, shuts down. She was doing Mama Morton in, in Chicago, and we were getting ready for this wonderful, because I still am on stage every once in a while, yeah, yeah, duo yeah. show that, that I was loving doing, and that was, that was it. Fiddler had already closed. Yes. We had already made the decision to close the show, and yeah. Fiddler was going to China, was going to Australia, was beginning a national right. tour at the Amundsen. All of that went away. That's what I was supposed to be doing this year. Right. Uh, it's been a challenge for everybody. But yeah. I love company. I'm proud of company. Company is coming back. I'm positive. And if everything goes well, I think Fiddler will, will remount and we'll be back. Well, I hope so. I too. mean, yeah. I and mean, then Haley and I just keep uh, uh, filming. Well, and we okay. just keep filming our show. <laughs> well, you and Haley. Okay, so, oh, you know, one of my guests this season is Blake Allen. Oh, yes, <clears throat> yes. Who, you, we might have done a, some shows with Blake Allen at, at Green Room 42. And you and Haley caught up and sang New York, New York. Yes, we did. That was right before everything got shut down. I think so, too. I think that was early March. Because, I mean, we were, I remember my partner and I were like, should we go? Is it safe? We said, let's go. And I remember you guys get up and it was like, wait, was that the Frank Sinatra show? It was. It and, was. And I sang. I got up in yeah, my you, pink suit. That's you did. <laughs> <laughs> Best review of my life. I couldn't believe, like, wait. I, I got, remember oh, that. I what? I but you guys got up and you killed it. You Thank were you. so great. And you do a Kendra and Ebb show. We do a Kendra and Ebb show called We Just Move On. I no. think I, I saw it at 54 Below. Yes, you did. We yeah, went yeah, yeah. back again and again to 54 yeah. Below. Yeah. Oh, so great. Well, on that note, I think it's a cheers. Here's to. The future of Broadway, the future of theater, and staying open to the artist's journey, my darling. Thanks for coming in. Jana Robbins. My pleasure. Here in the Rumpus Room. Welcome to the Bar Cart, the place where we make the cocktails you drink here in the Rumpus Room. Now, on today's show, we enjoyed a smooth, strong cocktail named after one of the most sophisticated stars in Hollywood history. Continuing our salute to drinks named after Hollywood stars, I present a new favorite, the Doris Dear Rosalind Russell. Now, Rosalind Russell was an American actress who earned four Academy Award nominations for Best Actress and received a special Academy Award in 1972. Rosalind Russell, who had started her career as a fashion model, hmm, was one of the leading ladies of stage and screen. She was, both in her personal life and film career, characterized as a sophisticated star. Russell had an extensive career that spanned over 40 years. One of Russell's favorite drinking spots when in New York was the one and only Stork Club. Now, the Stork Club, which operated from 1929 to 1965, was one of the most prestigious clubs in the world, a symbol of cafe society, the wealthy elite, including movie stars, celebrities, showgirls, and aristocrats, all mixed in the VIP cub room of the club. Hmm. A famous oasis after the ravages of Prohibition, the Stork Club was the place for celebrities to see and be seen. Now, one of my favorite stories concerning the Stork Club involves Evelyn Walsh McLean losing, are you ready? The Hope Diamond, all 45.52 carats at the Stork Club while wearing it out for a night on the town. You'll never believe that it was later, later found underneath a table. I mean, what were her hands doing under the table? Hmm. Another favorite is Ernest Hemingway cashing his $100,000 check for the film rights to For Whom the Bell Tolls to settle his bill. Hmm. 
It was Rosalind's soon-to-be Danish father-in-law, actor Carl Brisson, who introduced her to an Aquavit-based tipple devised by bartender Steve Hannigan at the Stork Club. After that first introduction, Rosalind Russell would commonly order this cocktail that soon became her signature drink, made with Aquavit and vermouth. Hmm, yum! <laughs> now, if you recall, last season, I made a very special old-fashioned using Aquavit, a wonderful liqueur from Denmark that I discovered when I lived in Copenhagen. <laughs> Such a world traveler. <laughs> it's said that her favorite vermouth to be used by the bartenders at the Stark Club was Dubonnet Blonde, which I couldn't find anywhere. <laughs> the actress contributed the Rosalind Russell cocktail to the one and only Stork Club Bar Book, which was published in 1946. Well mixed, shaken over ice, it delivers a crisp and clean flavor to the palate with a well-balanced and good bite of caraway. Now, as Roz says in this 1946 book, my father-in-law, Carl Brisson, introduced me to this drink, and six months later, I married his son. <laughs> How many of those cocktails did she have? <laughs> and now, the Doris Dear Rosalind Russell. Fill a shaker of ice. Add one and a half ounces of Danish Aquavit. Mm. One ounce of white vermouth, or blanc, as they say. Mm. That sounds good. <gasps> We're going to shake that up, do our COVID workout. Ah. And we're going to pour this into a little coupe glass that is actually, this is one of Taffy's Waterford glasses that she loved and often used. Cheers. Well, I hope you enjoyed your stay in the rumpus room today. I love when friends drop by and we, well, share some fun ideas and bring some joy to the world. <laughs> Don't forget, head over to www.dorisdeer.com forward slash girl talk for all the information and recipes in today's show. I love when friends drop by and, well, we'll see you soon. And don't forget, a dress doesn't get you anywhere. It's the life you live in the dress that matters. Cheers! Mmm. Mm. I feel like a gypsy. <laughs> Oh,